Today we're going to talk about the battles of Lexington and Concord. So this is Boston in the 1760s. Peaceful, calm, soothing. Then all of a sudden, Britain starts enforcing all these acts in the Quartering Act, which meant you had to house British troops unconditionally to the Boston Port Act. Then after events such as the Boston Tea Party and other minor skirmishes known as the Powder of Arms, frictions between Britain and angry colonists have reached a breaking point. Now before we explain how these skirmishes developed into the battles of Lexington and Concord, we must first find out how did everything come to this. Boston had not always been in this state. The story begins in the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, that ended in 1763. It was a war between Great Britain and the French, in which the latter was defeated. Though it was a decisive victory for the kingdom, Britain faced some serious economic problems. Long wars like these consume a lot of money, and now Britain was in a good deal of debt. What better way to regain that money than by taxing the 13 colonies, they must have thought. Thus, the Stamp Act came out, which taxed people by stamping nearly all paper products for them to pay extra. Now, also, tea imported from Britain was heavily taxed. So angered the colonists were by this that the Crown was forced to take back the Stamp Act in 1768. Furthermore, on December 16, 1773, some furious colonists stormed on British tea ships and dumped crates of tea into Boston Harbor. This resulted in the intolerable acts that further triggered colonial discontent for the Crown. Redcoats moved into the city to enforce the intolerable acts. The colonists' only source of arms was their local militias that were formed to repel Native American ambushes. Now they were ready at all times to respond at any call to defend against the British or proceed to war. General Thomas Gage, commander of the British forces in Boston, did not want any war to begin and so thought the best plan was to cripple the colonial fighting machine. He began sketching a plan in which the Redcoats would secretly move to the colonial ammunition stores in the town of Concord and burn them. This plan quickly became settled into reality, but even as they labored to keep this expedition a secret, the colonists were expecting them. Upon hearing the plans of the British, they moved their ammunition stores from Concord to all along a series of small towns along the road. It is worth noting, however, that merely burning the military stores of the Patriots might not have been Gage's one and only object in his secret expedition. From the very start of the rebellion, there were many remarkable leaders who wished to oppose the British, and most of them had fled Boston upon hearing that they were, they were to be hunted down. Two of these men were John Hannock and Samuel Adams. The British march was set for the night of April the 18th, thus planning to arrive in Concord by the morning of the 19th. Joseph Warren, another leader of the Patriots still in Boston, came down to tell Paul Revere and William Dawes, two trusted Patriots, to ride across the surrounding mainland warning the militias of the coming British expedition. This renowned action was later called the Midnight Ride, in, in which Paul Revere supposedly shouted to all, all homes on the road, The regulars are coming. The regulars are coming. Though Revere was captured before he could reach Concord by the British patrols, he successfully put into a, action a system of alarm. Their first known engagement took place at the town of Lexington, situated upon the road to Concord, and there a good number of men blocked their path. A redcoat major cried the words of defiance, and shots were fired. It is still unclear which side pressed the trigger first, though it is commonly believed the redcoats did so. This first shot is known as a shot heard around the world, it signified the beginning of the American Revolution. 
There were casualties on both sides, but quickly the colonists were forced to, were forced to a retreat, and were pushed back along the road towards Concord. A few attempts were made by the colonists to reform and fight, though none of them succeeded in halting the British. The militias thus yielded Concord to the redcoats, and while the British searched for the ammunition that was hidden, they reformed and marched back towards the town. By the north bridge spanning the Concord River, the two sides opened fire. However, the commander of the British detachment made a tactical error and was outnumbered. Many redcoats were killed in the following engagement, and they were forced into a retreat. It was a stunning tactical victory for the militias. They had all of a sudden defeated one of the strongest armies in the world, and this engagement provided morale for the battles that would follow. The rest of the British pulled out of Concord as more and more militias appeared suddenly from all sides. This exactly was what Gage had wished to avoid. Companies and companies of colonists pouring from everywhere in thousands and overwhelming his forces. That was exactly what happened. All along the road back to Boston, the British were harassed by company after company of militias, and thus their retreat was quickened. The battle ended with the Redcoats pulling back into Boston, which had fortified positions. It had been a two-sided battle, though it could be said that the colonists won. Not only had they repulsed the British expedition, but also from that day on, there began a year-long period of, period of time called the Siege of Boston, in which the militias cut off the redcoats in Boston that forced the British to evacuate finally on March 15, 1776. But that is something that will be explained in the future. For now, this was a colon colonial advantage the loss of three cannon and 500 musket balls could not pay for.